five, four, three. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is alias Chuck Finley with Talking Whatever Wednesday, here with a special interview today. Um, I've got Cincinnati rapper Cotton in the studio. Cotton, what's up? Not much, man. Just busy all the time now, it seems like. All right. Nice, nice. So just to get out of the way, some bona fides for us, man. You know, we've known each other for a long time. I've, I knew you th- through your brother, though. You know, we went to high school together. I'm not going to say any names. I'm going to keep it kayfabe. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you've definitely known me. You've known me since before the music. Yeah. So I've seen you evolve in, in your whole career, man. I'm, I want to say, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of you for sticking with it and, you know, really hopeful for the future for you, too. I appreciate that. Uh, right on. So fifth studio, fifth album coming out, dude. How's that feel? Uh, Good, I guess. It's going to be a minute for the album. Uh, Just simply because right now I'm focused on, on releasing singles. I got you. But album will be out this year. Okay. So what what uh what all singles do you got out right now? I've heard one. Uh, so um, last year I dropped what three, mm-hmm. three singles. Uh, that was uh talking my shit, confessions, white boy wasted, the remake, the remake of that. Um, the people that have been around know that song's been out for a while, but fell into some. Uh, we'll just say legal issues with that song. So I had to re-record it. I had to redo that whole song. Oh, um, yeah, that was fun. Um, but I uh, actually have another one dropping this Friday on all platforms called Robbery. It'll be the second release this year. Uh, January, I released a song called. Uh, oh, excuse me. Um. Yeah, it's called Imperfect. Imperfect. That released in yeah, I dropped that one in January. <clears throat> um, but yeah, Friday, this Friday, robbery will be on all platforms. Um, side note for those that actually pay attention and actually follow me well, uh, you can actually find it now if you go if you follow me on plat on the platforms Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube. You'll actually find it if you follow me. Okay. Um, it's, it's it's out there already. I've had people sending me videos using it in their videos and stuff already, which is pretty dope because I didn't even know that it kind of released a little earlier than planned. But I'm okay with that. Right on. So for everybody listening out there, tell them what, what it's like as an independent artist. It sucks. It Dead sucks. serious. It <laughs> sucks. Um, and, and I mean that in a good way. Like, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time now, um, independently. And, you know, it's it's rough when you have a, a home life and kids and stuff. It's, it's really rough because doing everything independently means you have to spend your own money. You ha- You don't have that backing that the bigger artists have. So everything comes out of pocket. You have to prioritize, you know, your home life versus your music. And it's like at at any given moment that can flip flop and change either way for you. You know, things come up, your car breaks down, kids get sick, kids need money for a field trip. That that money has to go towards your kids before it can go towards, you know, putting money into a new single or album or any project you're working on. People, mm-hmm. a lot of people don't realize that independently, like we, we have to pay for our own studio time. We have to pay for our own um, mixing and mastering of songs. Uh, every cover photo, every flyer, every piece of promo, all the marketing, like when you see independent artists um, videos, like we pay for all that out of pocket. And then when it comes to the marketing, you know, like you see your your favorite independent artist got a new music video on Facebook and it says sponsored. That means that they had to come out of pocket and pay Facebook to push that for them. And it, it's, it, it does suck. It does suck. I mean, 
you know, we don't, like I said, we don't have the backing that the big artists have. So like when we have shows that are out of town and we have those a lot, well, the lucky ones of us do have those a lot. Um, or we go on a tour, everything comes out of pocket. <laughs> the the travel, the gas money, if you need a rental car, if you decide to fly, it all comes out of pocket. And it, it, it does become rough because, you know, we all still, most of, most of the independent artists still work a regular job too. Yeah, and, and I I saw your uh, schedule's been pretty full lately with shows, what, in Indianapolis? And you live around Cincinnati, am I right? Uh, yeah, I, I just moved back to Cincinnati this year from Kentucky. Um, and Not Indianapolis, but I just, one, what, two weeks ago was in Tennessee. This past week I was in Michigan. Um, and then I've got an announcement and I'll give you the, the first run on this announcement that I got coming up is I've got a tour coming in May that I'm on. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, it's an Good independent shit, artist man. tour. It's definitely an independent artist tour. Nothing like it's not with a major artist. It's, you know, I got lucky to have some other friends in the, in the independent scene that we're doing this tour and they invited me along. So who's all on that tour? I mean, is that, is that a set lineup? Is it finalized? Can you talk about it? Um, um, as of right now, the tour is Mike vertical melody K and myself. Um, uh, we will have openers in every city. Uh, as of right now, there's five cities booked. I don't, do you have that lineup? The cities that I send that to you? Yeah, hold on. Um, as of right now, it's got five. We got five cities booked. Um, only one is local, um, and that'll be in Middletown, Ohio. Okay. Um, the tour is set to kick off uh, May 18th, and we'll be in Kansas City. Big shout KC out to Kansas City. Mo. Exactly. Uh, May 18th, Kansas City. May 20th, we'll be at in Middletown, Ohio. May 22nd, we will be in uh, Springfield, Massachusetts. The 20, May 27th, we will be in Chesapeake, Virginia. And June 2nd, we'll be in Topeka, Kansas. That is nice. the five cities locked in as of right now. Um but yeah, like I said uh, before, man, like I know they were putting this tour together and as independent artists, I, I, I you know, I'm always looking to, to help out and do anything for the other independent artists. That's part of what I do. Um, but I know that they're doing a, a big thing with putting ourselves on tour and I'm excited that they invited me along. That sounds excellent, dude. I'm so I'm glad you're getting these opportunities and helping younger people coming up. What, what advice would you give? Like, so, say there's an 18 year old kid, one to break out to, what advice would you give them? Um, don't do it. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> I always want to say, don't do it. Um, don't do it, but only don't do it. If you're not ready to invest a lot of time, money and mental stability into this, because this shit will break you. My bad. Are we allowed to cuss on here? Yeah. Yeah. He said, okay. Cool. <laughs> so, this is so, going straight on my podcast. This is not going on YouTube. You can say whatever. Right. I mean, um, I mean, so, you know, yeah, some, like, avoid stuff that'll get me, you know, the secret service at my door or something like that. But you know, <laughs> you might ask me this one. Um, okay. Uh, no, shit. Like, it, you've got to be really, really primed into knowing this is what you want to do to do it. Um, it's all about investing. And I don't mean just money. Money's a big part of it. Yes. Because if you want a big investor or a big company to invest or sponsor you, you got to show them that you're willing to do it yourself. Nobody's going to help you if you don't want to invest in yourself. And that means money, time, and like I said, your mental stability, because this, this shit will drive you crazy, man. Like, you can ask anybody that's been around me closely while I work on, even like while I'm writing music, like I'll be in the middle of writing a song and be like, you know what, fuck this shit, I don't want to do it anymore. 
but then there's there's been so many instances where it's just like nope nope mm -mm, i can't quit can't do it but i i've definitely been at the point where i've 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 fell back i took a few years off actually of making music just to to learn the business side of it and everything because you know in the the younger artists the, the newer artists i don't care how old you are the newer artists man if you don't know the business of side of things on how things work behind the scenes you will get screwed over so much and i took i took a lot of losses by not understanding how things worked and i got screwed over many times like so, what? i mean without without names you know you can tell us you know like what happened oh, no, no, no. i mean like booking shows um there's so many ways into booking shows and you that's another part of it is staying humble through it. Um, don't let your head get big. But when it comes to booking shows, there's so many ways it gets done. Um, like promoters will ask you to sell tickets or do a buy on. And there's a lot of artists that are like, oh, I won't do that. I won't do that. But that's part of the investing in yourself. Um, <clears throat> what that does is it shows the pro Hold on. I got some audio problems. Are you there? It shows that you're willing to invest in yourself. It shows that you're willing to invest in yourself. Um, it, it shows that you're able to bring a crowd. Promoters, if you want to get paid shows... You have to show promoters that you can bring a crowd because to promoters, they have to, you know, they come out of pocket on everything they do too. I've, I've been a promoter and it's, it's a rough, it's a rough business. Um, but <clears throat> when it comes to these shows, man, like I'm still, I've been doing this for so long and depending on the show, I'll still do a buy on, I'll still sell tickets to a show, but then what, I what's have a buy on. A buy on? What what is a buy on? So yeah, what is that? Is, what does that mean? Say, so say a promoter is bringing, and between me and you, like say they're bringing Tech Nine to be the headliner for a concert, right? I've heard of him. And I, I wanna, I, I wanna open for Tech Nine on that show. I wanna be on that show. Most of the promoters now, first and foremost, the promoter has to pay him whatever his cost is to pay to bring him to the show. Right now, they're coming out of pocket with that. So in turn, that promoter wants to make money on the show. So most of the time, your promoters are going to have what they call a buy on for the opening slots, which means you pay to get on that show or they call oh, it a buy okay. on or a, or a pay to play. So what they do is they try to book artists, enough artists that are going to pay to get on the show. That way they can cover everything they've spent on the show. So you've got to remember promoters pay the artists. They're paying for DJs. They're paying for a lot of stuff for the show to happen. Security, so, everything know. else that goes involved in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And so they want to recoup and make a profit as well. That's part of a business. You don't want to, you know, it's all about making money. So say we'll just use simple numbers here say you know it, it costs five grand to throw this show including paying the headliner and everything like that so what they'll usually do is they'll get enough enough opening acts so say they've got five grand out of pocket to make half of that back 2500 they'll you know they'll have x amount of artists pay x amount of dollars to pay back half and then what they want to happen is the ticket sales for the show to not only cover the second half, but also make the profit. Right. So where it is, is like I said, when you're, you're paying to get on these shows or selling tickets, what happens is, you know, if, if I get on a show like that and they give me X amount of tickets to sell, most of the promoters, you get a percentage of your ticket sales back. So that's a way to make money. It's a way for them to, you know, see your hustle and your investment in yourself. 
But if they see that you're not selling tickets, you cannot bring a crowd, they're not going to book you anymore. Because for a promoter, it's all about the number of people in that venue at the show. Right. Um, and then like, so like some promoters do just straight ticket sales. They give you your slot, you sell the tickets and that's how it works. Others. It's just a straight buy on just the straight pay to play. Um, I, I honestly only do shows that are buy ons or ticket sales. If it's going to be a good exposure show, um, because it doesn't matter how long you've been in this, there's always people you haven't reached with your music. So, you know, I always look at shows as an opportunity to meet new artists, new promoters, new venue owners, um, and make new fans and, you know, people that will support your craft. And, and you can always make your money back, you know, at, at the merch table too, I'm assuming, you know, you know yeah, 20 you bucks for a t shirt. If you spent yes. two fifty to you know to be on the show for as an example, you could probably easily make your money back. You know, selling ten t shirts or whatever. You know, I, I'm yeah. assuming, yeah. right? And see, merch comes into the investing in yourself. You know, getting getting a hundred shirts made, it isn't very cheap. Um, I've done that. I've done that. That is not cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap. Um, I, I'm not saying any names because I haven't worked with them in a while, but. You know, for a while, we made our own merch. Um, definitely, I think if you're independent and you want to invest in yourself and in making your own merch, getting the stuff to make your own merch is actually the better route when it comes to money. Because, you you know, if I go to a big company, which I have done and I still will do, um, and you get like 100, 200 shirts made. I could go on this tour and I could sell 30 shirts on the whole tour. And then I'm stuck with a backlog of 170 shirts, you know? Right. So I spent all this money and now I'm just sitting on it. Um, making your own merch, though, you kind of, you know, you can make as many as you want. And then also making your own merch, you can do what I call like custom shirts as in like you can just take pre-orders one at a time um like so if you don't have shows and you still need want people to buy merch like somebody can be like hey can you make it in a green t-shirt and a small you know because small is a very rare shirt size that people buy yeah. at shows um but if they want a small you know oh i didn't buy the small you know i can make one right now and ship it to them from door to door and still get the merch sales. So I always, I do believe that making your own merch is a good idea until you're, until you're doing bigger tours, like you're selling out thousand, 2000 person venues, um, even four or 500 person venues. But when you, when you know that the, you got people, a hundred, 200, 300 people showing up for you, you know, those shirts are going to sell. Um, so I definitely recommend buying the stuff. It only costs a couple hundred dollars and, you know, you can make your own merch, do it how you want. And then it's easier to do one at a time. Cause like, if you go to a big company and you're like, Hey, I just need five shirts. You're going to pay a lot for just five shirts because people don't realize the back end behind the scenes of that company. Um, they most people do the screen printing and to have those custom screen prints made, they have to make the screen custom, you uh -huh. know, then they have to take the time to press it. So they'd rather shoot out a hundred, 200 shirts and it's a quick turnaround. Um, but when you, you know, if you're end up sitting on all your merch, it's, it's just bad for your pocket. Um, yeah, we did the screen print thing for uh, shirts with uh, the podcast I had with your brother back in the day, and right, it was it was a small order, but there was like a twenty five dollar fee for the screen. Like yep, just that was the, the screen. That was the biggest fee on it. Yep the the screen the yeah because I mean they make that and then what they hope is that you come back and they already have the screen. So like I I built a rapport with a company. And, you know, I, I did have a deal with them 
to where, you know, we were going to do multiple runs of the same logo, just different colors. So, you know, they only charged me to make the screen once. The second that, round. Would that be your It's Cotton logo? I like that, uh, by the way. No. Actually, I never did a big run of those. I did. Those were all uh, home made in home in house. Oh, shit. OK. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, sorry. No, you're good. Um, but with the big company, what I did was uh, first run, we did 100 shirts. Um, so the 100 shirts were X amount plus the cost of the screen. But because I knew I was going to go back and keep doing business with this company, I made a deal. So um, in helping promote their company as someone who I work with, I had them put their logo on the sleeves of my shirts. Right. So, so I could be like, yeah, this is, you know, cause in my, in my business, in the music business, I travel and everything. And people are like, who did your shirts? You know, they want to know where I got them done. So I'm like, Oh, I can just show you, here's the logo. This is how you get a hold of them, et cetera. And in doing that, they actually gave me a discount. Yeah. Cause it's, it's promotion for them as well. Right there. Right. And then, and also in that promotion, like, like I said, I learned the business of it. So what I did was I, I made a deal with the owner, owner of that company and how it worked was I'd get the discount on my shirts. Plus if I sent them more customers, more, you know, music artists, et cetera, that were going to make purchases, I got a percentage of that purchase. Oh. So if somebody went and spent, three hundred dollars on shirts being made 20 percent of what they spend went into a side account for me so you know if they spend 300 i get x amount of dollars you know 20 percent is what 60 bucks so they'd put 60 bucks of that 300 into a side account and that would build as i sent more customers and then i would just use that to press my next run of merch there you go so at that point, once I got enough money built up, I didn't even have to come out of pocket anymore. I didn't even think about that extra side money that he was putting aside from everybody I sent. And then he still gave me a discount. So once I did like the third, fourth rotation of shirts, my stuff was free because of the account that I had built with him. And that's something these, these youngsters need to know about right there. Build those relationships. Yes. Building, look, building relationships is a major part of it. Like, I, I, it always seems to fall for me kind of in a, in a shitty situation. But, like, people, these younger artists going to local concerts, even if you're not performing, going and showing some support, the promoters see that, the other artists see that. It's a good time to market yourself. You know, hand out your stuff at these local things. It's a great well, like get some free merch together. A lot of stuff that, if you really dig into it, there's so many things you can do for really cheap to help build your name and your presence in the music scene. Um and and it's just basic stuff. I mean, all you gotta do is some research online to get some little little merch ideas. And you know, give that stuff out, give out, you know, like back in the day when people used to give out mixtapes and stuff, there's stuff you can do to give people for free. It might cost you a little out of pocket, but every now and then you got to do something for the fan base and the people that support you. Like what's your favorite, what's your go-to? To give out for free? Yeah. Um, what were we giving out for free? Well, at every show, we usually would throw out some free shirts. So, yeah, it would cost, you know, but I'm only losing the cost, really. Right. Um, so if a shirt cost me X amount of dollars to make, I'm only losing that. We throw out a few shirts. Um, we did used to do the embossed uh, jelly bracelets. Um, we used to throw handfuls of those out free. Um Simply because if you go online, there are places that make those for dirt cheap. I mean, dirt cheap, like they'll cost you 15 cents a piece to get made if you buy a bulk order. Um, so throwing, you know, 30, 40 of those out into the crowd isn't 
a big deal. That's stuff you can just hand out to people if you're, you know, just mingling, just net, we call it networking. So if I'm just networking yeah. a show, I'll go to another artist show locally, even if I'm not performing and network because, you know, I've got shows coming and, you know, I'm trying to build a name too, but you don't want to do it disrespectfully. I was, I was going to ask that, like, how's that, how does that work? You know, do you like, is it like a friendly oh, environment? You contact the guy beforehand or is it got to be people that you know already? You know what I mean? Like, uh, well, I mean, when you've been in it, I guess it's different for me. I always say I've been blessed with the people around me because uh, a lot of the artists, like the shows I go to, they're, they're the headliners, even if they're local guys, I've known them for a long time. So, you know, it's not a problem for me to, you know, they're people I've worked with. So it's never been an issue for me to go network one of their shows because most of the time we've either got songs together or shows together anyways. Um, so they're all for it. Um, and the, like I said, the promoters love seeing artists that aren't on the show come through because it shows that you're supporting other artists and not just thinking about yourself. Mm -hmm. But it definitely works. It definitely works. Have you ever had a time when a promoter's like, nah, man, I don't want you over here. Any oh, pushback or anything? Uh, um, I won't say any names because we're oh, actually. Yeah, I, don't want, I don't want names. I don't want names. <laughs> we won't say any names because we're actually in good standing right now. Uh, I did have a promoter, um, an out-of-state promoter that I worked with a few times. And some stuff went down. I was supposed to do a show. I was supposed to sell a ticket. And um, like I said, that, that, that career and life balance. So my job ended up hitting me at the time with uh, overtime that was mandatory on a Saturday, which was the night of the show. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. So I found out a week ahead of time. And I had to let him know, like, dude, I, you know, I know I signed the contract. I under, I, you know, I understand how contracts work. So in the contract, it stated that if I didn't sell the tickets, I had to pay out of pocket for the tickets. Cool. Um, so, yeah, and I had a lot of tickets and they were not cheap. But so what happened was a week before the show, I got hit with the overtime and I'm like, dude, I'm not making enough money off the music to be able to lose my job over it. And so I told him, I was like the contract, you know, I'll give you the money for the tickets. You have a week to find another artist and you can give them the tickets and they can sell them. So you'll make my money off these tickets and you can get more money off the other artists that sells tickets. And man, he blackballed me from venues and shows and everything for years and, and it wasn't until the end of last year that we got back on good standing and stuff. But it was it was just a big misunderstanding. Um, I ended up not paying him, but that's because he had blocked my number, blocked me on social media, everything. Um so I didn't have a way to get a hold of him to pay him for those tickets, but he absolutely any shows he was involved in, I was not allowed on. Um, I wasn't allowed in the door. I wasn't allowed at the venue. Jeez. Like it was, it was oh. pretty bad for a couple of years. But I always worked my way around it. I mean, in the long run, I think it helped me because it was it wasn't a Cincinnati venue, but it was a closer venue. But he did okay. have his hand in some Cincinnati shows and stuff with bigger artists. So, yeah, it kind of hurt me on opening for some bigger artists. Um, but in the long run, that's when I started doing more of my out-of-town shows, like going to Tennessee and and going, you know, more in Kentucky and way out of state to do shows, South Carolina and everything like that. Because Like that tour you got coming up this this, this summer. <laughs> yeah to bring it back <laughs> yeah definitely i need people to check out that tour because that tour is going to be awesome um 
but yeah, man, I mean, like I've, I've had those downfalls where I've had other promoters that are like, sorry, I, I put your name in it and they automatically rejected you because of this and this. And I'm like, all right. So I had to do what I had to do. And I ended up making more connections out of town and meeting new artists and building the fan base way bigger out of town than in town because of that. So it, it hurt me, but it helped me too. And is that why you stick to the, the buy-in kind of shows rather than, you know, selling tickets like before? Like, like- Well, no, I mean, it just depends. Cause see now where I'm at now with the music, <clears throat> um, I still don't care to sell tickets um, because I do have a a, a nice following. Um, But you have to remember, like on the business side of it, um, certain places just if you haven't built a big enough fan base there, you're not going to sell tickets there. And it's hard to like say I've got an out of town show like Michigan. I was just in Michigan. Um, I don't have a big following in Michigan. So for me, I, I know I need to build that. Um, even though I did co-headline that show in Michigan, um, I didn't have to sell tickets or do a buy on for that show. I actually was a co-headliner on that show. Um, I actually got paid for that show. I do get paid for a lot of my shows. Um, nice. <laughs> but but yeah, it does. It, it It's a hit or miss. Like I said, I'll still sell tickets. Um, it's just about knowing where you're going. Um, if I go to Tennessee, I get a lot of love in Tennessee. Um, Tennessee shows, I don't have to sell tickets. I don't have to do buy-ons um, because I know, and everybody that, like, if they book me there, they know I get a lot of love down there. They know I'm going to bring people to a show. Um, but, you know, a lot of people don't want to travel. So, like, I've got a lot of people in Cincinnati because it is my hometown that, you know, they really fuck with me. But you know, I can't get 20 people to travel to Michigan to go see me. It's difficult. Um, You know, there, there's some instances where, you know, they'll show up to certain shows and uh, not other shows, but ticket sales are very hard, man, because you, and that's for anybody because you're hoping that somebody has the money and in our economy right now, and anybody sparing 15, 20 bucks for a ticket is hard on anybody and you know that's everywhere man that that is everywhere right right now right exactly so you know like when when i get hit with a ticket show if they're like hey can you sell tickets it's like yeah i can sell tickets and then you know a month later you're like dude i could only sell five because everybody will be like yeah i'll get you friday when i get paid and then you hit them back up Friday, like, hey, you still want those tickets? And they're like, oh, man, you'll have to wait until next Friday. I had something come up. And ticket selling tickets is hard. Just for as an independent artist that's not got the biggest buzz, it's difficult because, you know, it's not the fact that the people don't like your music or they're not cool with you or whatever like that. It's just the fact of do they have it to spare, you know? You never know, you know, I could be like, oh, I got 20 people that are going to show up and then you sell two tickets because 18 of them are, oh, I'm going to be out of town. I got to work. You know, I can't get a babysitter, things like that. You never know what's going to come up. So, you know, that's where the buy-ons come in handy because that promoter knows that, hey, he might not bring 20 people. That promoter knows he's still getting paid, though. And as an artist, it still gives you the experience. It still gives you the, the, Hey, I opened for this person. You can kind of put that as a check mark. Like I I did a show with tech nine. I did a show with, you know, this person, so-and-so. Um, and it also expands your fan base because yeah, nobody in that building might know who you are. They might not know your music, but that's your job to get on that stage and make them remember you and make them like you. So a buy on show, yeah, you're you're doing it for the experience and to to build a fan base out of people that don't know you. Right on. Um was there anyone that like like took you under their under their wing basically when you got started or at any part in your journey so far? 
Yes, like a, and I will name, I will name drop him. So, um, at, as me and you know, not everybody knows. Uh, when I first started rapping, dude, I did I didn't do it intentionally. Like it wasn't what I wanted to do with my life at the time. I did it as a joke. Um, my my big brother and a couple of his friends <clears throat> would go to the studio. And I thought that was cool. You know, I was a young teenager. I thought that was pretty cool. And I, I wrote I this have these albums, actually. <laughs> and, and, uh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> so, so, like, you know, I wrote a song. It was just joking around. And, you know, things happened. My brother made music. He kind of dissed me afterwards. But his friends told me to keep going, and I did. But... The person who really took me under the wing was the guy that ran the studio. His name was uh, Mr. Sneed. And he kind of showed me, like, this is how you write a bar. This is how you write to the beat. This is where you come in on the beat. Like, he kind of showed me how it works. Because I didn't know any of that stuff for real. You know, I just thought I was rapping because I knew some songs, you know. And uh to this day, me and me and Sneed are still cool. We still talk. He's actually he's a he's a big time producer right now. He produces for a lot of bigger names. Um and but we still we still talk. Like we still talk just like then. I've always said he's like a big brother to me, especially in his music stuff, man. Like if if he hadn't have shown me how to do stuff, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Right on, man. Um yeah, talking about those first those albums from your brother, I I, I remember those. Uh, Man, <laughs> let's talk about some uh, late '90s beats going on there. It was rough. Mm. It was rough. Yeah, man. I found I found recently. I found all of my original like first songs I recorded ever. And it's so crazy listening to him because I was so young. Like, my voice hadn't changed yet, so I sound like a little girl. <laughs> yeah, do you, mean, uh, young. do you ever listen to, back to your, like, like, your first album, your second album, and go, all right, I, w- I would do that now, or I would change this or that about it now? Or are you just like, that's yeah. done, it's it's set in stone? No, you know? no, dude, I still, and this is a big thing for artists that artists need to know. Like, I still listen to my old stuff, but I still let people listen to my old stuff. Because it's, if, if, you, if you've if you been doing it long enough to where you're doing this album and this mixtape and this and this and this, you can go back and kind of see how the artist grew from the beginning to where they are now. Um. Not going to lie, I, I'm cocky when it comes to my music, and I'll play some of my old stuff from, like, 2010 and older and be like, damn, bro, like, I said that? Like, I can't believe I said that. Like, and, like, it's just In a, it's in a good way or? In a good, in a good way. Okay. In a good way. Or, like, like ooh, that was fucked up. Why did I say that? I know like I like I said I'm cocky when it comes to my music dude and like I I truly believe that even my old stuff is still better than a lot of this new stuff that I hear today so I'm you know I'm not trying to be a dick about it it's just listen to it I can let you listen like maybe the quality of the song wasn't as good because you know it was thrown together so fast but my my lyricism i i'm i'm a big i'm i'm making a big point that lyricism is a big point of music to me like what you say needs to make sense um what you say needs to have some substance to it and even then all my stuff had substance to it like my songs were structured i stayed on the topic of the song i didn't just say something because it sounded good It, it was all put together well um but yeah, I still, and that's what I was getting at is when these artists, they forget that it'll humble you really fast when you realize that you think you're this like this top dog and shit. And you realize like people don't know who you are. Like there are people that are following me now that just heard of me like a year or two ago. 
they have no clue about that old music. They think I'm a new artist. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm, I'm been fucking doing this 22 years. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, here's all my old stuff. You know what I'm saying? And they love it. Most of the time they love it. Sometimes, you know, but as an artist, you got to, you got to learn to, to take that, that bad with the good because mm -hmm. it's not for everybody. Um, if somebody doesn't like it, oh, well, move on. That's not a fan of yours. They're, maybe they just don't like that song. Give them options. And that's what I like to do with every album is I try to put something on there that <clears throat> um, will relate to different people. Like, so say I put 10 songs out. Um, I don't expect everybody to like all 10 songs. Uh, if I gave you an album, you'd probably listen to it. And if you like two or three songs, cool. That's the two or three songs you'll listen to. You could look at the other ones and be like, man, I don't like this one, but this one, I like this. One. So I, mean, I can I do that with most albums, actually. <laughs> Just <laughs> right, exactly. That's how I am. Like people yeah. are like, do you like so-and-so? And, -so? and uh, what about this song? And I'm like, yeah, I like this song, but I don't like this song. Like, I don't, don't play that around me. Like there's but, a couple songs out there that I'd be like, I'm like, if this band played this song, it'd be a lot better. <laughs> you know right. I mean? Exactly. <laughs> And I mean, it's just like that. But what I try to do on my albums and I used to do on my mixtapes is I try to put a variation of different type of songs. So I'm a I'm a very versatile artist. You know, most of my my sound is that, that dirty South trap music. But that's what I grew up loving. Um, but not everybody likes that. So, you know, I've got the like if you listen to my singles I've released. You got White Boy Wasted. It's a party song. Everybody loves that song. I hate that song just because I had to re-record it. And, but everybody loves it. So I'm still to this day performing at every show because everybody just loves that song. They gravitate towards it. Um, um, but then you've got like, I've got a, a single I released called Confessions. It's more deep. Excuse me. It's, Sorry. You know, it's, it's discuss, you know, talking about the bad and the good with everything that's come with it. it. It's not really a trap sound. It's, you know, whatever. And then um, Imperfect, I released Imperfect. And that is basically a song for the ladies that are like ride or die for their dude. Um, but then, of course, we got the songs that are like shake your ass stripper songs, you know what I'm saying? So I try to put all that into one project because – I want everybody to find something they like. I don't expect everyone to like everything, but I hope somebody can find something they like on every album. Like there's been at least one song from, you know, every one of your albums. And I'm like, this could be on the fucking radio right now. Right. If somebody bigger than me was listening to this song. Right. And and I'm I not kissing your ass. Too. I'm not kissing your ass when I say that I'm saying that because I actually genuinely like the song I'm talking about, you know, like there was right. one like standing that. in the spotlight. I remember from one of one of your older albums. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, this could be on the fucking radio. This is cool. What the fuck? Right. right. See, and that was on. What was that on? Was that on? Was that on? Which album was that? It was a few years ago, man. I'm sorry, but was it the one with the orange cover? I think or so. Maybe. Cover? Uh, maybe purple, maybe purple. Okay, yeah, that was one of that was an older album, but yeah. like, yeah, if you go back and like, just go through each song, like you don't even have to listen to the whole thing, just like the first forty five seconds of every song, and you'll see that like every song is different in some type of way. Yeah, it has a a similar vibe to this song or whatever, but every song is different. You know, and as artists, we have to, we have to do that. We have to not only pressure ourselves to top the last one. We have to, you know, we have to remember, hey, you can't say that because you've already said it before. You know, so we're constantly moving in a forward motion to not um, repeat ourselves. Right. I actually just saw a, a video of like it was Lil Wayne and Eminem talking and they've been in this shit for so long and they were having a conversation about just that. Like, have I said this before? Did I repeat myself? You know, you've got to push yourself to not say the same thing. Otherwise, you're done. If you can't find 
new ways to say things, you know, vocabulary wise or story wise or however you want to do it. If you keep repeating yourself, it, it just gets old and nobody's going to listen to it anymore. Which I think that was one of the uh, um, talking points about Eminem's last album that he just went back to his formula. You know what I mean? Just right. talking shit about people. And that was really all he was doing again. Right. And I was like, all right, man, we've right. seen this from you. Let's see some growth from Marshall. Well, you see, I, I can understand that. And I, I am an Eminem fan, but not a super fan. Um, but like you have to like I look at it from an artist's point of view. And when he was doing the growth, he wasn't getting the reactions he was getting before either. So a lot of artists do that. So like in Eminem terms, he'll he even, you know, talks about his his drug abuse and stuff openly. And he knows, like, he put out an album and after he got off the drugs and stuff, and that album didn't do so well. And so he went back to the formula that worked because as an artist, you have to take that loss sometimes as, damn, this this whole thing was a flop. Um, what I got to go back to what was working. I tried something different. It didn't work. You know, it's like, you know, you, you, you've got to try new things. And if it doesn't work, OK, then you don't do that anymore. Then you try another way and you just got to keep progressing. But I understand falling back into the formula of what works. Yeah. Did you ever find yourself in a rut like that? And, you know, how long did it take you to realize that you were in that? Um, yeah, actually, um, there were the few years I took off of making music. I hadn't written anything. Um, I was doing shows here and there, just performing old stuff just to stay to stay relevant because that's a big thing in the music industry is staying relevant it's difficult um because man you could take a month off and people will forget you so fast um but yeah i took a couple years off and what i was doing at that time was i was running an independent label i was managing artists i was booking them shows you know i was producing helping helping artists you know with their stuff and and then after that few years, I mean, I really didn't even want to get back into making music, honestly, because I was making more money running the label and stuff like that. So on a personal level, it was it was, hey, why even go back to music? I don't really you know, it's not feeding my kids, you know, and mm -hmm. doing what I'm doing now is. Um, and. I ended up finding a new artist to work with. Um, we'll gladly say her name, Doris Ann. Um, found her on Facebook on accident one day. Um, she was a newer artist, and she's a female country rap artist. Um, okay. And, and the reason I found her is because we had a, I mean, right now on Facebook, I think it's definitely like, 1200 mutual friends between me and her um at the time though it was probably like four or five hundred mutual friends in the music scene that we all had and similar fan base um she had only been making music like i think a few months six months maybe at the time and the reason i saw her was she made a facebook post about needing a new studio to record at me being me at the time i'm just floating through i don't give a shit <laughs> you know, and you know how on Facebook, if mutual friends comment on somebody's post, it notifies you. Right. So like every day for like a week, I'm seeing more and more of my mutual friends comment on that post. So that post kept popping up and popping up. So finally, I just messaged her and I'm like, hey, where the hell do you live and where do you need to record at? Because I run a studio and. She told me where she was from. She was, she's from Kentucky. Uh, she's about 30 minutes away from the studio. <clears throat> so I brought her up, paid for her first session, recorded her. We, we were doing that and she was out doing shows out of town already as a, as a new artist. She was in Texas doing shows and everything real quick in her career. Um, but one day we were at the studio recording and 
she had the hook laid and she laid a verse and she was like, I was like, what's the next verse? And she was like, I don't have one. And I'm like, oh, okay. So write something. We'll come back, re record that second verse another time. And she was just like, she had seen me previously at a show earlier that year. She knew I was an artist. She didn't know that I had taken that step back. Um, but she was like, you're pretty dope. Why don't you just put a verse on here for me? And I'm like, I don't, I haven't written or recorded in years. And so <clears throat> I just went ahead and freestyled a verse and her eyes lit up and she was like, man, you're better than 80% of the artists out here. You got to get back into recording. You got to start making music. Da, da, da. So that was kind of me jumping back into it. And it's funny because I don't know, a year later, after I started, you know, I started recording again. Um, that's when I did the song Talking My Shit. Um, recorded that, finally released it. Um, and then I'm not going to say any names, but we had an issue with the label that I was running and we were working with. Um, so me and her both stepped away from that label. Um, got our masters and everything back so we own everything um and we started our own label after that and that definitely was that that kick back into me doing music and is that heart of stone heart of stone was the label that i was working with yes okay and there's, so what, there's no hate. Let me let me make sure I say this. There is no hate, there, no animosity. Just we we were obviously going two different directions at that time. Gotcha. And that happens, man. You know, um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm an ICP fan, so I'm going to say ICP and Twisted. Same thing. Right. You know, right. I haven't I haven't listened to much to their stuff in a while. I don't know what's going on. If they've made up, but something happened, right. their friendship dissolved, their business relationship dissolved, and you know things right. like that happen. And it did happen. I mean, I was with Heart of Stone for like 15 years, and I was so upset at what happened that I was like, "No, nah, I can't do it. I'm walking away too." And what a lot of what it was was. You know, I had taken Doris kind of under my wing as a new artist and was all focused on helping her get her music together. And then the uh, the guy that runs the label, like really runs the label, owns Heart of Stone, runs his studio. Um, he decided he just w didn't want to work with her anymore. And for me, I was like, what? That sounds like a bad I'm business decision. <laughs> I'm not going to lie at the time. The, the big reason we brought her into Heart of Stone was even though she was a new artist, dude, her following was double mine. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is going to get Heart of Stone out there way more. Put our name out. I mean, she was making her own merch and putting the Heart of Stone logo on it, wrapping the label hard. And then he decided he didn't want to work with her anymore. And I was like, you know what? Then I'm done too. Because this is like me and her were, you know, even under Heart of Stone before we walked away, we were out touring, doing shows out of state, getting the name out. And I felt like you you pushed her away. And in doing that, you're screwing up everything me and her have been doing because we were pretty much the only artists going out of town and doing shows and the merch like <clears throat> And it, it, I felt like it was going to hurt the company terribly. And I walked away with it. But now you're back doing your own thing, man. How, how, how does that feel? Is it a relief to be doing it more on your own, a free from a, a label like that? Or is, or, is, is there, or is there more anxiety, let's say? It's... I wouldn't say there's any anxiety to it because I've been doing it so long. It's just like, okay, I'm still doing what I was doing, just not with the same people. You know what I'm saying? Um, but what crushed it was 
um, what crushed it was the fact that, you know, I had helped helped build that label as an artist and everything and helped shape what it was becoming. And I had to walk away from it. And that gotcha. sucked. Uh, if you need to handle something, you know, I can edit stuff out, man. It's, it's okay. Um, <laughs> look no, look how you're motioning to somebody off, off screen. I was, but it's good. <laughs> okay. Okay. But, and then, you know, after we walked away from heart of stone, uh, me and her still worked on music together, still was touring and doing shows and everything together. And in the end of 2021, we decided to take the brand that we were representing, which was it's NFG, it stands for no fucks given. And we decided at the end of 2021, I think it was, we ended up making the brand into a label. I'm going to need a shirt. That's that's all I'm going to say right now. I'm going to need a sh- I'm going to need a shirt. Yeah. We will have merch soon. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how closely you follow my Facebook anymore, but um, yeah, we decided to make it a label, and it was just me and her for a couple years, and then this year we actually put another artist on the label, and his name's Bull Davis. He's from. I think Massachusetts is where his, his hometown is. And man, we just been working all year um, and building this label and getting these shows. And it's, it's, it's hard, but it's, it's worth it. Okay. Um, and we are almost going for an hour, man. I got, I want to hear about recording white boy wasted. No, oh no names, no names, but I have to know what the hell happened here. What happened? Okay. No names. So, so literally, white boy wasted. Uh, the truth of this song is, I wrote it while I was at work. Okay, I was working at uh, in, in that big company with the A and the smiley face underneath of it. I got you. Yeah, because fuck them, I'm not promoting them at all. Um, <laughs> they don't need any, anybody else's money. It's okay. But I'm not like, promoting I them either. That song. I wrote that song while I was at work, wrote it in my head, never wrote, I never wrote the lyrics to that song down ever. Um, And once I had it, I had three verses in the hook in my head. I messaged my dude at the studio was like, yo, I'm coming to the studio right after, right after work, dude, I gotta lay this. Well, we laid it and it kind of sat. Like I didn't release it at first. Um, and then literally, like, White Boy Wasted came from how I, I used to drink. I was never an alcoholic, but, like, I only would drink at shows or, like, at my friend's house on a Saturday or whatever. But when I got drunk, I would get wasted. Um, I mean, that and, that kind of sounds like part of the song already. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Right. But, <laughs> I mean, like, and I can hold my liquor. And like, I mean, I can mix liquors, I can do all that, and I'll no hangovers. I've never had a hangover ever. <laughs> but I'm, I might message um, your brother for verification, but you know, <laughs> my brother, my brother thinks I'm an alcoholic, which is funny because I'm not. Um, but yeah, like you, you can message my oldest brother and ask him; he'll tell you. Like, dude, we played at his house. My oldest brother. Um, <clears throat> we played beer pong at his house with Jack and Coke. And then while playing, we went through two pictures of Jack and Coke. Then I drank half a bottle of crown. Then I drank half a bottle of Jägermeister and a couple of beers. And I was still good. Like Jesus Christ, dude. I, yeah, I could handle it. And like, I slept for four hours, woke up and was sober. So, but the original cover for white boy wasted, um, was actually a picture of me where I went, we went to this block party and I got wasted, wasted. And the original picture, somebody took a picture of me sitting on the couch with my hands on my face. Cause like, I couldn't get up. I couldn't think straight. And we used that as the original cover. Um, but I pulled it and whatever, but yeah, dude. And like some of the lyrics in that song is like, uh, in the song, I say, drinking, drinking, drinking on that goose and Gatorade. 
um, that actually came from me in high school. When I was in high school, I used to mix Grey Goose vodka and Gatorade together because nobody would know. But it would be a 32 ounce Gatorade and 16 ounces of that 32 would be vodka. They knew, man. They knew. Okay. They did not know. I still graduated. <laughs> but, you know, it's it's just, you know, <clears throat> it came about because, like, that song is how I partied, <clears throat> you know. In the song I talk about, in the hook, it's, you know, um, you know, tell the bartender I need 30 more cases because we're going to drink. If you drink with me, we're drinking. We don't just gotcha. sip on it and you know what I'm saying? Like we're if we're drinking, we're going hard, we're partying. You know? And and I say and the Jack and the Henny and the Crown and the Jaeger, they're all dark liquors. That's all four of my favorite dark liquors. And yes, I do mix them. Um I've I've got great stories of mixed liquors at shows. Why are you looking at me? Because <laughs> it was your friend. Um <laughs> Yeah, I did a show in Wisconsin last year, year before, dude, and I was mixing Hennessy and um, Jack Daniels. And I typically don't do like mixed drinks. Like I don't typically like usually I'm shooting shots of alcohol. I don't usually mix. Um, but yeah, I was mixing Hennessy and Jack Daniels and drinking it straight. Yeah, and, and that's, I, that's a I lot. Was ready. And then we had it that that night. We had a I won't say names because you know a lot of people do know, a lot of people don't know. But I I was if you know you so know ready. I was, I was so ready to fight the DJ that I had people pulling me back and was like taking drinks from me the rest of the night because they knew I was about to get off the hinges. But it ended up being a good night, anyways. Okay, so what about the re-recording of the song? So the re okay, so the original beat, um, I had got it from a producer, and um, it's actually one of the guys that he produced a lot of stuff for Kevin Gates. Um, but it came into when I was trying to purchase right, hold on. that beat. I, I, I had a call. I had a call come in, so I didn't get the last twenty seconds there. I'm a, okay, so on. That beat, the original beat for White Boy Wasted, um, the producer of that, he's actually produced some songs for Kevin Gates and stuff. And <clears throat> when I went to purchase the beat so I would own it, I could not get him to contact me back. And okay. I knew then because everybody loved that song. Every time I'd show up to shows, people would be like, are you performing White Boy Wasted? It's my favorite. I knew that song was going to be something. And if you don't own the rights to the beat, you can't monetize it. So I could release it for free or on the business side, I could re-record with a new beat and monetize it and make money from it. Okay. And, can, I mean, it sounds crappy, but you know, can, can you um, re-release with a new beat and still perform with the original beat? Yes, you can, but it's, n I, I don't, I don't. Okay. Okay. Um, that was just, that was because, just a question that popped in my head. I was like, wait, but performing it is one thing, you know, right? Go. It's, it, it is, but it's not because it, it just depends on how you look at the business. So as an artist, um, we have our distribution for our music. Okay. And then we also have uh, the companies like BMI or ASCAP that we have to register with. And what they do is they pull – um. Like, say, um, say you played one of my songs during your podcast between my distribution and my registration with BMI, they would pull that it got played and I would get paid for it. Um, and that's kind of how it works, like if they used it in a movie or a TV show or a commercial or anything like that. That's what these companies are made for is to pull that, hey, it's being used. It's been played this many times. You get paid this much per time it's played, et cetera, et cetera. Um, huh. So it also works with performance rights. So um, when you perform, 
your BMI and your ASCAP, whoever you're registered with for that. Um, you also get paid through them through that as long as the the venue is registered. So they know through the venue and through you, like you have to go in like a week before, et cetera, and be like, hey, I'm performing this song, this song, this song. So it technically counts as like a stream, basically, when you perform each song. So if I don't own the rights to the original beat and I perform the one with the original beat, I can get in trouble for that because I don't own it. I got you now. Okay, okay. That makes all so, more sense. Yeah, so I went ahead and there's actually um I've got four or five other songs I'm actually re-recording. Um, none of which well, one, one of which I previously released, but I'm gonna re-release that too. <clears throat> um, but I've got four or five other songs that I've recorded and I couldn't get the rights to the beats. So I'm having new beats made and re-recording them so that I do own full rights to the songs. Um, but yeah, it does make a difference. I mean, at first, if you're new to the game and everything like that, nobody's really going to pay attention, but you know, it's really frowned upon and looked down on if you've been in it this long and you don't own the rights to your music as an independent artist. Yeah. So okay. like we really, what we, what we do is like, even, you know, like people are like, oh, that's a YouTube beat. That's a YouTube beat. Okay. So you either go buy it or there is a way to lease beats, which I don't recommend leasing because you don't own the full rights to it still. Uh -huh. you, it's, it's just a, a, it's a mess if you have to deal with it. But like what I tell people to do is if you find a beat on YouTube and you really like it, go to another producer and tell them, hey, I want something like this and pay for it. Pay for your producer to make it if you can't buy it off of the YouTube producer. And that way you own your stuff. It's, it just mm -hmm. makes things simpler, and it goes all the way back to investing in yourself. And that sounds like that's key right there, man. Investing in yourself, which is what you've done for this whole time, dude. And yeah. it's, it's really showing in what we're seeing, man. Cotton, thanks so much for being on the show, man. Do you have any uh, parting words? Uh, where can people find your stuff? You know, socials, everything. Yeah, hit it. You can you can find me on all my music on all platforms: uh, Spotify, Apple, Pandora, everywhere. Just search Cotton K O T T Y N, and you will find that. Also, if you search K O T T Y N, as in Cotton uh, Five One Three, you will find me on Instagram and Twitter. And if you search just Cotton K O T T Y N on Facebook, you will find my personal page and my artist page there. All right, dude. Thanks a lot for being here, man. I really appreciate it. I appreciate right. you, man. Thank you. All right. I'm going to cut it off now. <laughs> <laughs>